wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. You would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men. It's one of those mornings when I could just sit and enjoy the presence of the Lord, but it's my turn, so I guess I, <laughs> I, uh, I was talking to someone yesterday about my sermon today, and I said that it, there's, a, portion, there's a, a bit of it that might make you sad, and uh, she informed me that I made her sad last week, and that was Mother's Day. I didn't know I did that, but... Uh, but preaching is teaching. That gives me an opportunity to say that. If you have a pastor that preaches only feel-good messages, then beware. And if you have a pastor that preaches only sermons that beat you up and make you feel guilty, beware. But somewhere in the center there where we can learn and we can teach uh, the Bible, that's where I want to be. The Bible paints the good and the bad, and it ultimately is the good news. So, loving God with my intellect. I tried to think of a good title. I, 
sometimes you try to think of a great title and you never come up with quite what you want. But uh, that first verse is from Matthew uh, 22, 37, and I'm reading it from the Amplified Bible. And it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then it out, in parentheses, it puts intellect, because that's really what it's saying. So, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and intellect. Now, let me read to you from Judges. It's in the Old Testament. Judges, chapter 10, and beginning with verse 6, and it'll kind of kind of take you a little bit where we're going today. Again, the Israelites, again, there's that word again. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Astoreths and the gods of Aram and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan and Gilead in the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah and Benjamin and the house of Ephraim. And Israel was in great distress. And then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you, forsaking our gods and serving the Baals. The Lord replied, when the Egyptians and the Amorites and the Ammonites and the Philistines and the Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Moabites oppressed you and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? But you've forsaken me and you've served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Verse 14, go and cry out to the gods you've chosen. Let them save you when you're in trouble. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. And then they got rid of their foreign gods and among them, and that was among them, and served the, the Lord, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. When the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead, the Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah, and the leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, whoever will launch the attack against the Ammonites will be the head of all those who live in Gilead. Now, I'll I'll try to put that together for you. That's just kind of the beginning verses. A Pennsylvania couple who told police their faith forbids any kind of medical treatment were charged with the pneumonia death of their two-year-old uh, daughter. And they were perhaps the latest members of the church or the sect to be prosecuted for failing to take a dying child to the doctor. Jonathan and Grace, that was their mom and dad's name, attributed the November 8th death of their daughter, Ella Grace, to God's will. And they were charged with involuntary manslaughter. If you remember, a long time ago, we talked about the story of the little five-year-old baby named Jessica. Uh, the district attorney charged her parents with criminal negligence and indicted them and found them, or at least the dad, guilty. When the trial was over and he was asked about the verdict, his response was, well, God is my judge, and I'll give an account to him. And he was right. In that statement, like all of us, unless he is already forgiven and is one of the children of God and somehow is acquitted, he will stand before God's judgment seat and give an account for the way he lived and the choices he made. And on that day, uh, with God as judge of John and Jonathan, was their names, if he asked you to serve on the jury... What would your verdict be? More importantly, what do you think God's verdict would be? So as you think about that, uh, that the question that I put before you, you might consider the story of a man named Jephthah. How many of you know a lot about Jephthah in the Bible? Anybody? Not too many. That's what I thought. So you get a new story, and you may remember some of, about him as we go along. Uh, Jephthah was a judge in Israel. He was not a black-robed jurist sitting behind a high desk with a gavel. Uh, the judges in the ancient world were political, military, sometimes religious or semi-religious, charismatic people that God raised up at a critical time in history to help his people and to lead his people. Someone has labeled those days as the Death Valley days of Jewish history. 
In fact, the writer says in chapter 10, verse 6, again, there's that word again. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, now this is the sixth time that they've turned their backs on Jehovah. The sixth time. And God, and, and uh, the sixth time they've actually, they, they, they uh, brought in gods from surrounding nations. God's made with hands. God's from the area of the Mediterranean. God's from the nations around the Jordan River. And God's from the enemies of the Philist- who were the Philistines. And soon they adopted the lifestyles of all of these gods that they apparently thought they needed. And they adopted that lifestyle of idolatry, everything from prom- uh, sexual promiscuity to sexual or sacrifice of children and uh, all of so many other things. And God led them Uh, let them get away with that for about 20 years. Didn't do anything. And then he punished them, the Bible says. His wrath. He allowed the Philistines to approach from the west. He brought, the Bible says, he brought the Ammonites from the east, and they continually would attack the borders of Israel. The Ammonites were uh, especially aggressive. Uh, They believed that the land beyond the Jordan was theirs, so they would attack over and over again. And finally, they became so brazen that they were attacking the uh, central tribes of Judah and Benjamin. So the people are living in fear, the pain is deep, and they came to regret the way they had been living. But regret is not repentance. They hadn't arrived there yet. Regret is dancing the dance and discovering you actually have to pay the orchestra, or regret is discovering that your deeds actually have consequences. So they sent their regrets to God, and he sent them back saying, well, you've been so interested in all those other gods. You've been following them. Why don't you let them save you? You know, the gods of silver and gold and wood and stone, you know, the ones that can't save you. So they finally repented. They put away their foreign gods, and they restructured their lives, and they resolved to worship only Jehovah over a long period of time. And then the Bible says, God heard their cries. They took pity, he, he took pity on them, and what? He raised up a man named Jephthah to deliver them. So the marquee, the headline comes out in chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, Jephthah the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. God has all kinds of leadership positions, and he doesn't manufacture leaders like, you know, Volkswagen manufactured the Beetle. They were all alike. He doesn't do that. They were sort of the same. God's leaders are unique, like uh, Michelangelo's creation of Adam, or like the Picasso that stands in, in the plaza in Chicago. Very, very standout, very different. Each judge was fashioned by the time in which he or she lived and the kind of background they had. So, Jephthah will first of all say he was a man of the times. He was fashioned in a very difficult, dysfunctional home situation. His dad, whose name was Gilead, and he was from Gilead, I don't know how, quite how that works, but uh, his name was Gilead, who was evidently a leader. Gilead had a one-night stand, his dad, a one-night stand with a prostitute. She got pregnant. Gilead let her hang around until the baby was born, and then he sent her packing. And of course, that was Jephthah. You don't have to have a degree in counseling to know that there was big-time tension in the family. Uh, Gilead's wife knew the baby was the result of her husband's infidelity. His brothers despised him. The children despised him. The kids were cruel. He would go to, to play with his brothers, and they would say, get out of here. We don't want you with us. We don't like you. Your mom's a prostitute. We don't, we don't even, you don't even know where she is. And they would just continually harass him. I wonder how many nights he cried himself to sleep. I wonder how many days he fought back tears with his little fist, releasing his anger. You know, happy golden days of childhood are for most people in the world, even in America. Not, well, kind of a myth sometimes, you know? Sometimes they're pretty tough. Kids can be cruel. So this unexpected, unwanted little boy grows up to be incorrigible as a teen, And when he was old enough, he left the community and he went beyond the Jordan to a place called Tob. The the, the text says he became the leader of a band of adventurers. If a gang is attacking your enemies, they might be called freedom fighters. But if they're attacking you, they're probably called villains or criminals or a gang. So Jephthah had, had become a mighty warrior in this time. If Hollywood made a movie about him, his part might be played by 
I couldn't think of any of the more current ones, but I think about Chuck, Chuck Norris or Jack Palance or Sylvester Stallone, that kind of guy. The heads of gangs were exceptional. Even today, they have exceptional qualifications. They have organizational skills. They have to have good minds, and, and some of them could run GM, actually, maybe better than GM is run sometimes. Have to be good with their fist. They have to have an anger that won't go away, an anger that often was developed in maybe a violent home life or a dysfunctional family setting. And out of that background, Jephthah becomes a great warrior. He's a great leader. He and his gang have a reputation. Everybody knew about them, even the folks back in Gilead. The folks back home, the ones that despised him, the ones that looked down on him, they realized they're going to have to fight the Ammonites. So they're looking for somebody to lead them, and they're looking for someone to protect them. And again and again, the name Jephthah resurfaces. You know, he's over here, and you know, you remember, you know, Gilead's son, the one we ran off? They need a champion. So finally, the elders say, well, all right, let's go to Tob and let's talk to Jephthah, son of Gilead. And let's say to him, we're sorry. Let bygones be bygones. We were wrong. Please don't hold a grudge. We'll invite him to come and, and lead our armies and bring his. So a delegation is sent and what a delicious moment that must have been for Jephthah. I mean, undoubtedly some of the men in the delegation were kids that had grown up with him. Now here they are ready to consume not only a plate, but uh, a lot of crow. A whole buffet of crow. Practically on their hands and knees. And they said in verse 11, or uh, chapter 11, verse 6, Come and be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. And verse 7, Jephthah responds, didn't you hate me? Uh, didn't you drive me from dad's home? Actually, it says father's house. Why, why do you trouble me now? Okay, oh, you're in trouble. He knew that all along. And they admit, you're right. But we need you. We need you now. Won't you come? You can be head man. If you want to, you can be head man. Now, Gilead is a mountainous region, sometimes called Mount Gilead. Uh, it's also been called the land of Gilead. And the Ammonites were a descendant from Lot's granddaughter. So, please come and lead the land of Gilead and fight the Ammonites. Now, Jephthah says, I could do that, but I don't want to fight your battles and then... As soon as it's over, you reject me again. And you say, oh, no, 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 no. You come, you can be judged for life. We'd be glad to have you. This is a lifetime appointment. So he came with his mighty men of valor. He's very willing to fight, but he, he was really a man of peace. So he sent a letter to the king of the Ammonites, and he tried to persuade the king that he had no right to their land. He argued from history. He argued from common theology. He, he, he argued from, re just tried to reason with them. But if you're a king and you have an army and you think you can win and you're aggressive, uh, then you're probably not going to listen. And the Ammonite king didn't, and he continued to be aggressive. By the way, that continues to this day, just last week, in fact. So Jephthah prepares for battle. Now, he may have been from a dysfunctional, difficult background. He may have been a, a gang leader. He may have been a tough guy. But he took God seriously, very seriously. He, he refers to God as Jehovah more than any other person in the book of Judges. Uh, Jehovah was the covenant name of God. And when he went to battle in verse 29, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord. Something that was said about only three other judges. He was a man sensitive to the Spirit of God. And just before he went to battle, he did something else uh, that he shouldn't have done. He went to God and he said, I want to be sure, I want to be certain that you're with me, so let's make a deal. In verse 30b, it says, If you give the Ammonites into my hands, the first thing that comes out of my house I will sacrifice as a burnt offering. Shouldn't have said that. He wants to impress God with his sincerity, not with his abilities, but just with his sincerity. 
he's sort of sealing the deal, and it's kind of a faith builder for him. Yes, I felt the presence of God, but I just want to be sure as before I go into battle. So it would have been a standard thing for these people to offer sacrifices. I mean, he, was, he had been surrounded by all these nations that, that worship false gods, and then Israel was doing the same. And remember this, as you hear this story, he was a man of the times, okay? Well, he did battle. He scored a mighty victory. He came home a mighty warrior. Did you remember what I just read? If you give the Ammonites into my hands, the first thing that comes out of my house, I will sacrifice as a burnt offering. And as he arrives at his house, his daughter, his only daughter, his only child, runs out to greet him, singing and dancing with laughter. She's the first one out of the door to greet daddy, throws her arms around him, and kisses the salty tears that roll down his cheeks because she begins to realize these tears are not tears of joy. He told his daughter at some point about his vow. I, she had an incredible response, a, a noble response. She must have been a kid raised well. She said, Daddy, if you promise, it's a different time, you, of course. Daddy, you, you promised God. If you promise God, you must keep your promise. But if you please, give me two months to say goodbye to all my friends, and then I'll come back. And she did. That's the sad part, by the way. <laughs> She did, and he did to her as he had vowed. Now, what's the lesson here? And, or, you know, they say the moral of the story. The, the story reinforces, first of all, what I've said a number of times, even last Sunday. Don't ever promise God anything. Never. Because you'll break the promise. How many times you said, you know, if you let me do this and this, or you'll get me this, then I'll do this, but then you don't? If you promise God something, you better keep your promise. So he's trying to keep his promise. Anyway, don't do that. Don't try to make a deal with God. Your yea is net yea and your nay is nay, the Bible says. It wasn't necessary. The Spirit of God had already empowered him. The victory was already his. Plus, God would not require us to keep vows that we later would find out if he had bothered to check wasn't the Lord's will in the first place. Leviticus and Deuteronomy both forbid human sacrifice. But he didn't know that. How much would you know about God growing up as he did in Gilead? How much would you know about God if you grew up in Tob? In fact, how much would you know about God living in the United States, where there are churches on every, in every town, sometimes on every corner. We have bookstores that sell Bibles. We have radio programs that have an array of good and not so good preachers. We have television stations devoted to preaching and teaching. But how much do Americans know about God, really? And how many people are sitting in church this morning that don't have a clue why they believe what they think they believe? Wow. Not much. How much did Jephthah know about God? He didn't know enough. He didn't know much, and he sacrificed his daughter, but he didn't have to. So the que and he was loved by God, I can assure you. I'll show you in a moment. What is God's judgment on Jephthah? Well, you don't have to wonder that very long, because if you go to Hebrews in the New Testament, which is uh, the, the, uh, actually the... Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is the chapter on faith, and it talks about people of great faith. So if you go to that chapter 11 in Hebrews to verse 32, it talks about all the great ones of the Old Testament, the great faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and Rehab, and then Rahab, and then you, the writer is wrapping up in verse 32, and he says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to, call, to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson, and Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. So he's singled out by the inspired writer as one of the great men of faith in the old Bible, a man approved of God. Now, what about Jonathan and John, Jessica's dad, the fundamentalist preacher, and layman, I won't be surprised to see them in heaven because one of the things that the text is telling us is that God overlooks ignorance. And I'm glad. I'm glad. God overlooks ignorance. Sometimes we do things and later realize, wow, 
How stupid was that? But he doesn't overlook unbelief, and he doesn't overlook disobedience. One thing we learn here is the importance of knowing Scripture, knowing our theology, and knowing God intimately. Without strong theology, you can believe in God, but do a lot of damage. Uh, example, Jephthah, Jonathan, and Grace, and John, three little girls all dying unnecessarily. Didn't have to. Archbishop William Temple once commented, if your concept of God is radically false, the more devout you are, the worse it will be for you. If you attend church conference, and I have attended church conference after church conference, and they're fun, and you come home sometimes and don't learn a thing, and other times you really do, but um, you go to the church conference, and you may hear someone, maybe people or a teacher or a leader say, look, I, you know, he's got a new idea. I don't preach theology. I'm I'm not really into theology or doctrine. I think people need to have an experience. People need to know how to relate. Sometimes just stand and praise God and feel it. Well, I like to do that. I was feeling it pretty good over there a while ago. Just feel it. I don't give much time to theology. Well, the next time you go to your doctor and you say, Doctor, I've been having such pain and, and headaches down my back, clear down my neck. Could you prescribe something? Could you prescribe maybe some medicine to relieve my pain? And your doctor says, well, you know, I don't dispense much medicine. I don't do medicine. I, we certainly studied medicine when I was in medical school, but I don't give a lot of credence to it, you know. Uh, I mean, you know where my focus really is? Bedside manners. I want my patients to feel at ease, and I want them to be relaxed and comfortable, and, you know, ambiance, atmosphere, uh, do you feel it? I'd find a new doctor. C.S. Lewis grapples with the whole issue in one of his books, and he says he was delivering a lecture to a group of people in the Royal Air Force, and right in the middle of the lecture, the old sergeant stood up and he said, well, I've got no use for all this talk about God. Mind you, he goes on to say, though, I believe in God. I felt him out there in the desert when I was in the service. If you experience God, you don't need to talk about it. Well, I think Lewis understood what he was saying. But let's say you go to Panama City Beach. I'd say Panama City Beach, when you hear my illustration, I can't use uh, the keys because I can't get lost in the keys too easily. Now, I may point the wrong way, Donna, but I don't ever turn the wrong way. I, I do always point the wrong way. North is south and south is north until I get to the highway. But let's just say you're going to Panama City Beach and you walk on the powder white sand and you breathe that salt air and you pick up a few shells and you just like to feel the wind in your hair and the sun in your back and that's a wonderful experience. It is here too. And then you go to your motel room, you pull out a map of Florida the panhandle, you're looking at the map and you're looking, you're in the very same place that you were just a few moments ago, but it's not as exciting. It's a piece of colored paper. It's kind of, uh, you know, boring. But C.S. Lewis says there, there are a couple of things that you need to know about that map. It's based on the experience of many people. So it's not just your experience driving to the motel and walking to the beach and having dinner at Pineapple Willie's. You know, people better qualified to analyze the area and study the terrain and view this area from the sky will design a map with mathematical precision. If you really want to find your way around the panhandle efficiently and quickly, you've got to use the map. How God, now, now, God may overlook our ignorance, and I'm glad he does, I tell you that again. But he prefers that we not remain ignorant. He prefers that we make good use of the map. That's what I've been reading from this morning. The one that he provided. And use all the tools available as we read and study the map. Great faith is wonderful. And it's, it's required, by the way. The Bible says it is. Joseph, uh, uh, Jephthah had great faith. Jonathan apparently had great faith, as did Je Jessica's father. And that is pleasing to God. But I can stand here and tell you in the Bible where they were all wrong. And I can, I can show you the scripture. I can show you right where it's at. Great faith without theology, without doctrine. Great faith without at least some knowledge of the scripture. Great faith with little understanding of what you really believe can leave you vulnerable and in error. 
I don't know, maybe this wasn't a very happy sermon, but it's one sometimes we need to hear. Love God with your heart and your soul, but also with your intellect. Know what you believe. If you don't know what you believe, I'll try to help you find out. Maybe I'll learn something too. Know what you believe. It can very well keep you from making mistakes and grave errors and acts of ignorance. So there's too much at stake to ignore that last line, heart and soul and intellect. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, but also with all your intellect. So let me close with the words of St. Paul to Timothy. Be, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love. It's amazing. We've heard about that in music. We've heard it musically, how you love us, how we love you, and how you call us to, to love you. Help us to, to return that love to you by obedience and by faithfulness and by grace and by reaching others and being an influence and a reflection of Christ. We love you today. We don't understand. We can't even begin to understand why you love us but you do. And we are so thankful and grateful in Christ's name. Amen. Will you stand with me, please? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God give to you his peace until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen.